In this week's video, I have 20 simple face drawing tips. Welcome back to my channel. On this channel, we do drawing videos like this one, lots of watercolor content, also watercolor pencils, even some mixed media and motivation for artists too. Please do consider subscribing, it's completely free. And unlike many channels on YouTube, we are fully cat approved. So lots of books have been written about drawing faces and one of the most famous ones actually featured a technique that we now know as the Loomis technique. And it basically takes the head and makes it into the shape of a ball and then sort of extends the jaw from there. I'll put a picture up so you can see roughly how that looks. There have also been other techniques that have become quite well known. They're very useful actually for illustrators. So I think these are great techniques and they're great techniques if you're building up sort of a face almost from nothing. So I think that their real strong point comes when you're doing something like a cartoon or a graphic image and you need to actually build up a character from scratch. Now, when it comes to doing actual people in a painting or a picture, I find them a little bit long-winded and I think there are some much simpler methods that we can use to estimate the shape and the size of the head and where the features sit within it and then also to add the features in. Today I'm going to be showing you 20 face drawing tips. We'll start right from the beginning with the angle and the shape of each head and then we'll continue to adding the features. So in this video, I'm going to draw with a ballpoint pen. It will be scruffy, there will be errors, but I know that it shows up much better on camera than a pencil, so that's what we're going for today. Now we are looking at overall basic ways of drawing faces. These are not necessarily something you would use for a really precise photorealistic portrait, because even professional portrait artists sometimes use things like grid techniques. We're just going to look at basic ways of getting someone's face here, whether they're up close or a little bit further away. And the first thing we want to look at is the shape of the head. So you may have seen that we can make the shape of the head something like an egg. So it's an oval and it's a little bit wider at the top. Now with anything I show you today, it's going to need to be adjusted for that particular person. These are general principles that you can use to start getting things in the right place before you clarify and get detail. Now, if the head is shaped like an egg from the front, it may look a little different from the side. So when someone's head turns to the side, you'll find that it becomes flatter along the face part and it becomes more elongated like this as we have the back of the skull and then we have the chin area here. So we can start by looking at the face as roughly oval shaped and adjust it slightly the more people turn their head to the side. Now we're going to look next at the angle at which somebody holds their head. So I'm not talking about turning their head to the side, but actually tipping their head over. Heads are heavy and people tend to tip them. Before I draw this, I must just apologize for the state of my finger here. I was teasing Mr. Gimlet with a toy and his claw caught down the side of my nail and sort of ripped out. I have rammed pseudocreme in it. In the UK, pseudocreme pretty much cures anything. You can use it for skin conditions, you can use it for wounds, broken arm, depression, pseudocreme. So back to the subject. What I want to do now is just find the angle which someone's holding their head at. Now, many of you have got confused about this after previous videos and you seem to want to sort of know, does this line up with the center line? The answer is yes and no. For instance, the center of this person who's holding their head straight is down the middle. And if I want to see what angle they're holding their head at, it's not tipped at all. That's going to coincide. But this person here, the center line is going to be here. But I just want to find the angle someone's holding their head at so that I can draw that initial egg shape. And you see, See, it doesn't always line up and people are like, does it come out the top? Does it come out the crown of the head, Michelle? It's just a line for you to get an impression of roughly the direction to draw that oval shape. So you're looking really at the lowest point and then the crown or the topmost point. As I said, don't overthink it. I would pop that line in before I even drew the oval. Let's talk now about finding the center line, which is important. So that's different to the angle someone is holding their head at. This is actually the line that travels. Let's look at this gentleman here, travels through the center of the face. Now it won't line up exactly with the tip of the nose because the nose protrudes further out 
than the face, but it will roughly come along here and it will line up with the center of the lips and that groove that we have, that channel. I'm sure there's a name for it. Tell me what the name for it is in the comments if you're in the medical or the aesthetic beauty industry, perhaps. The line is going to go through that center and out the bottom of the chin. As I said, it won't necessarily directly come through the tip of the nose, come a little bit further in. So on our first example of our person that's looking straight ahead, it's just straight down the middle. But on the person who's got their head to the side, not only is it further over to one side, but it's also going to be curved. And we're looking at creating curved guidelines now because the skull curves. The further this person has their head turned this way, the further over that line is going to go, which means that when we come to draw the features, they're going to be foreshortened on this side and larger and more spaced out on this side. And we'll look at how to plot those next. Now there's one mistake that everybody, particularly children or people that are new to drawing, always make when drawing faces. We put the eyes too high. Why is this? This is because no one is interested in foreheads. To us, the eyes are the top feature in the face, so we're gonna place them high up. If we look at this lady here, make sure she's uh, completely on camera. If her eyes are here and her chin is here and the crown of her head is up here, her eyes are about halfway up the face. And this is a rule we can use, but it is adjustable and it does change. So let's go back to our little egg people. We can place the eyes about halfway down the face. We can then divide this space here, eyes to chin in half again and we can place the tip of the nose. Then we divide again the tip of the nose to the chin and we can place the mouth. Now people have said to me, well this line here, is that the center of the eyes? Is that the eyebrows? Again, it's going to vary from person to person because people do have their own characteristics. It's just an initial way of placing things and this is movable. So if somebody tips their head up or down, this is going to change. Now, when someone tips their head up or down, it becomes more foreshortened. We see more of the top. Even if we're looking upwards, we would still see more of the skull. So when someone's face tips up or down, that egg becomes compressed and a little more circular. Now let's look at this chap here. He's got his head tipped right the way down. And what this does is it moves those guidelines down and it compresses the features lower down. So when somebody is looking down, the line of the eyes is going to be lower, as is the line of the nose and the line of the mouth. Now, if we go back to the first example, you might say, well, why aren't these guidelines curved? In reality, they would be, but it kind of depends where your eyes are level with. So if your eyes are level with the person's eyes, then this line would appear to be quite straight and these would curve down slightly. It's all dependent on eye line. If you were a little bit shorter than that person, then these lines would curve very slightly upwards. Now to see this effect of the guidelines moving more clearly, let's just give these people a hint of features. And on this person down here, we're going to see more of the tops of the eyelids, the tip of the nose and the mouth. Now, if the person is looking upwards, the same will happen to the face. It will appear to be more compressed, but the features this time will move upwards. So the skull is more rounded because we can see more of the top of it and the features are going to become higher in the face, more spaced out, and we will see more of the features. So the eyes will become a bit more open. We'll see more of the nostrils. Here's our mouth. And you can see, we can see much less of the top of the head here much less area for placing hair because this person is looking up, whereas this person is looking down. And these lines are much closer together and more compressed. And for both of these people, they haven't got their head tipped one way or the other. So the guideline is pretty central. So let's look at what happens when somebody's head is tipped over to the side. Like in this example, what happens to these guidelines? 
If we look at this lady here, we see how her features are very compressed on this side and her center line would be right over to one side here. Look how much extra skull and head we can see this side compared to this side. So a head is not an orb. It's not completely circular. It's got that broadness at the back where our brain sits. And that means that as the guidelines come around, they're going to straighten out towards the back. Let me show you on a drawing. So here is our initial head that we drew with the center guideline over to one side. So now we want to get the features in. Whether the lines go up or down depends on whether or not we consider they're looking up or down. And what we're going to get is a straightening here of the guidelines as they come to the back of the head. Now the area that is most curved will be this area where the line intersects the center of the face. So when someone is looking over to one side, we can get our guidelines like this. And as I said, when we start to put features in, they'll be smaller and more compressed over here. And that's because they're foreshortened due to perspective. And things like the mouth will be much shorter, there'll be much less of them here, and they'll be much wider and elongated on this side here. So we can combine the angle of the head, the center line, whether someone is looking up or down or fairly level, and then how far round to the left or the right they're facing. So here I'm combining all of those methods together to get someone whose head is tipped and facing over to one side and also looking down. So there's still an elongated shape here, but it's a little bit more compressed. It's a little bit less height to it because this person is looking down. So we're seeing more of the top of the head and we can use the center line, which is coming round to effectively get somebody's face shape looking down. You may have seen some YouTube videos where somebody explains these methods with dead straight lines. I don't care how many million views they've had, that is inaccurate because the skull is curved. Of course, you can use your own straight lines here and there if it helps you, but do remember that the features of the face cannot sit on a dead straight line unless they are looking bang slap straight on and are exactly at your own eye level. Let's look at the neck. And one thing I will say generally about necks is people tend to do them too small. I've seen people with these tiny little pencil necks. But the neck actually goes into the skull and supports the head. Now, if somebody is face on, it's going to look something like this, depending on, you know, how long or short their neck is. We're going to have something like that. But when somebody is side on, and we can see it here, we can see much more of the neck here as it becomes part of the back of the head. So when somebody is on the side, we are going to see more of the neck going up into the skull like this. And looking up or down also affects how much of the neck we see. If somebody is looking up and stretching their head backwards, we are typically going to see more of the neck. When somebody is looking down, we may see less. Or if they're looking very severely down and we are above them, we may even get the shoulders coming straight here and almost covering up the neck itself. It's all a matter of observation. Let's talk about placing hair on the head. So I found a photograph of the person with the least hair that I have got in my photograph collection, at least. Obviously, some people have no hair and that's very easy to draw. We don't have to worry about it at all. But even people that have very fine or very flat or like me, very straight hair, they still have a significant gap between the top of the hair and the skull. Too often I see people giving their faces some kind of lobotomy and almost drawing the hair sort of from here as if they've been cut off. You're going to find that for everybody, unless they're completely bald, they're going to have a little bit of height to their hair. And obviously the thicker and curlier and fuller the hair is, then the more they're going to have. So you're going to find more with younger people, more with people with curly or afro hair. So you must have that gap above. How much of the hair we can see will of course depend. If somebody's got their head tipped up or down like this, it's going to make a big difference. And in this case, you're going to see, you know, maybe a lot less of the hair. In an example where the head is tipped down, we're going to see obviously a lot more of the hair. 
But remember that everybody has got a bit of a gap between their scalp and the outer part of their hair. So what about ears and the placement of them? Obviously, sometimes you're going to find that the ears simply can't be seen. Ears are actually very far round the back of the head. They're not halfway round. If you have a look at yourself in the mirror or somebody from the side, you'll see they're a long way back. Let's look at this lady here again. Look how far back her ears are, which means that when somebody faces directly forwards, you're only going to see a hint of the ears. Now, how about where to place them? I like to look at ears like I look at all peripheral things like hair and hats. I like to get the features right and then just place them on. So what we can do here is we can sort of take a line across and I can see that his ears are pretty much in line with the tip of his nose. So if we take a person here looking forwards and assuming we can see some of the ears, we could place them exactly where we lined them up in the picture. Look at our chap who's looking down. Look how high up his ears come. It's almost like a seesaw from the back to the front of the head. When the head tips down, the ears tip up. So when it comes to ears, I wouldn't worry too much. Just be careful not to draw what you can't see or to draw more than you can see. Remember that when someone's facing the front, you'll see almost none of their ears, just a little bit. When somebody is facing sideways, you'll see a lot more of the ears, of course, unless their hair is covering. Let's go on to features now and look at the brows. Now, obviously, between different people, different ages, we've got beauty treatments and things like that. People's brows are going to vary a lot. Some are straight, some are curved, but they all have a relationship to the shape of the skull. The purpose of the eyebrow is actually to catch things and stop them going into the eye, protect that area a little bit like the eyelashes. But see how this chap who's got his head on the side, his brow bone comes round from his nose here and it's going to help us to place those brows. So with somebody that's looking forwards, we can just judge where the brows are and what shape they are for that particular person. When people are looking down, however, we're going to get this strong correlation between nose and skull shape. And the same if they are on the side, the brow almost comes round from the nose on one side. When someone's head is on the side, we'll see a lot more of the brow this side, as with all the features, and a lot less this side. As for actually drawing the brows themselves, it's good to have an upwards and outwards motion like so. You could, of course, start with a little bit of a guideline to show you where to put that brow shape. As we lift our pen or pencil off of the paper, it will taper just as hairs do when they grow. And so we naturally need to shape the brows upwards and outwards. Let's look at eye shape and distance. It's often said that the correct proportions, just as we had this guideline idea of three lines to place the features, there's another rule that says that the gap between the eyes is equivalent to a third eye. So in other words, if you've got the width of the eyes here, you should be able to fit another eye in between. Of course, that's going to change when someone's looking on the side. I'm not going to draw that here because it's going to look a little crazy, I think. Now let's go on to the actual shape of the eye. Again, these can vary. We have Asian eyes here, which are very oval shaped. We have this strong slant down the front here. This chap here has very narrow eyes and a lot of flesh around his eyes. As people grow older, this area becomes narrower due to the sagging of the flesh. Younger people and babies will have more open eyes. This is, I believe, a very young Scarlett Johansson. And with everybody, we have a little straightness on one side. We have more of a curve on the other side. And we have the tear duct here. As I said, there's no exact rules, but you don't want to miss this tear duct. The eyeballs themselves will sit within the area like this. And then, of course, we have the lid at the top. Again, how much of this is going to show is going to depend a lot on age as well as race. Let's look at the pupil and the iris. One thing to notice is that the top is almost always covered by the lid and sometimes the bottom as well. We can almost see the bottom of the iris here. Our chap with narrower eyes here, it's also been cut off. 
but what we never see is the full circle. Except in horror movies or severe drug taking, you will not see all of the iris. So when you draw it, you want to make sure that you're observing closely because the top part will be almost always covered by the lid. Then we've got the pupils. These can be large or small. They adjust depending on the light. And there's often a highlight within them. So when we're shading with a pencil, we can often leave a little white area. There's usually some form of dark rim around the iris. And then we have, of course, these colored parts coming outwards. Leaving a white highlight will make the area shine. Now, what about eyelashes? These on the top lid tend to curve underneath. They come out from under the lid. They're a bit more open on the bottom. They will be thicker in younger people or, of course, people wearing eye makeup. And if you're trying to draw somebody or paint somebody with eye makeup on, what I suggest doing is getting the shape of the eyes right as if they're wearing no makeup and then just add the makeup afterwards, add the eyeliner after you've got everything right. The best way to draw eyelashes is to curve out and under. You see how they almost come down a little bit. Again, this is going to depend if somebody has got their head tipped down, then you're not going to see as much of that underneath curve. When it comes to the lashes on the bottom, you can usually see a small gap and they will be smaller and more sparse. And we need also, just like with the eyebrows, to draw from base to tip so that we get a little bit of tapering at the end of the hair. Let's talk about noses. Now, the one thing that people often do wrong with a nose is to draw all the way around. There's no strong definition where the nose begins and ends. It just molds into the face. The only definition is here where we actually see the side of the nose as it protrudes from the face. With someone who's facing more straight on, we won't even see that much of a hard edge. We'll just get some shadow that will delineate the side of the nose. And the only slightly hard edge is down the side here. So remembering that the nose pretty much comes from the brows. With somebody that's looking face on, we may only have one or two hard lines like so. This area here may just be delineated with shadow. Obviously, this will be much more natural if you're using a graphite pencil. With someone side on like this, what we will have is the brows. And the side that's facing away from us, this is where we will get more of a hard line for the nose. But even then, as we come down, we get less delineation and just a hint of the nostrils. We can then add any shadow that we see in the picture. Hints of nostrils. And that's one of the areas that people also get wrong, which I'm going to show you next. It's really important not to assume that you can see the nostrils all the time. This lady here, although her head's not tipped down, which would typically hide the nostrils, she's got a big smile and it's kind of pushed her skin backwards and made her nose protrude more. So we can't see her nostrils, but we can see her baby's nostrils. We can see quite a lot of this chap's nostrils and I suspect that's partly because we've got an upward angle to the camera here. This lady here, again, she's photographed from below and she's tipping her head upwards slightly. She's looking up slightly. And so we can see quite a lot of her nostrils, an average amount here and here far less as this lady is tipping downwards. I believe it's Bridget Bardot. So one thing that people often do wrong with noses is they just show too much of the nostrils and they end up with something like this. And then if you compound that by outlining the nose too much, you can end up with something that looks very much pig-like or dog-like. Going back to our initial examples, when would we see a lot of the nostrils? We would see them when someone has got their head tipped back or is being photographed from below. And when someone has got their head tipped downwards, we would see almost none of the nostrils. Again, it's important to carefully observe your subject. Let's look at drawing lips. First of all, let's think about that center line as it goes through this center area here. It's really important that the center of the lips aligns with the center line of the face. That's why it's a good idea to draw those guidelines in lightly to start with, because if you don't get that right, then you're going to find your lips don't look right. The easiest way to draw lips is to start with this center line. So let's do that. So let's imagine I've got the center line going down the face, somebody whose head is tipped over to the side, 
and I can just start by observing what that center line looks like. It's much easier, just like drawing anything else, a leaf or anything, it's much easier to get that center guideline right first, rather than trying to trace the outside line of a shape. As humans, we're just not very good at doing that. You'll nearly always go offline. So we're going to start with the center line of the lips and make sure that the middle of the lips, and I don't mean in distance, I mean the center point of the lips, which will be narrower on one side if the person has their head turned, that that center of the lips is aligned with the center line of the face. From here, we can place the line of the lips in, remembering to align that bow of the lips with the outside. You will often find that this part of the lips doesn't come fully to the end here. On some people, it can be very narrow indeed. We also have examples where makeup is used to overline the lips and take it much further out than it would naturally be. Look at this gentleman here. He has a very, very distinct line that his lips take. So if we take our center line, we can then see that his lips face down like this. And how easy it is now just to get those the right shape once we've got that center line in place in order to guide us. One other thing that people sometimes get confused by is the curved guidelines and the shape of the mouth. Now the guideline here could be upwards, which would tend to give that mouth a frown, but the person might actually be smiling. So that line just gives us an area to place the lips along. It doesn't mean that the lips themselves will necessarily follow that exact route. Just because the head's facing downwards doesn't mean that that person is going to necessarily be smiling. And just because the lines here are facing upwards doesn't necessarily mean that that person has a downturned mouth. Let's look at an open mouth or teeth on show. Again, when you start to draw the mouth, you want to draw the center of the mouth. In this case, it's open. So again, you would start with your center face line and then you would be looking at drawing that shape of the inner part of the lips. It certainly is more difficult to do it this way. It's more difficult to draw someone whose mouth is open, but we can still get that inner shape and then add the lips. The lips typically become thinner and more stretched when someone's mouth is wider open. And what about teeth? Now, a big mistake that people make with teeth is to overemphasize them. So if we just put them in lightly like this, we might see the odd part of a line here and there. We might see some shadow in between. We might see a little bit of the gums on display. We're going to get a very natural effect. What you have to be careful not to do is to really strongly outline the teeth. As soon as you start to really strongly outline the teeth, they are going to take on far too much prominence in the face. Whether working in color or black and white, it'll just end up looking like a horror story. The teeth are white or cream or some gradation of and should be very much underplayed so that you don't end up with something that looks like a Dracula movie. Lastly, let's talk about lines on faces and the difficulty with drawing children and young people sort of up to teenage years. Have you or someone in your family been affected by seeing a drawing of an 80 year old baby on the internet? I know I have, I see them all the time. One of my more controversial videos gave people a list of things not to attempt when they are a beginner. And one of those was drawing babies, because here's what happens. You start to study the baby's face or the young person's face, and you start to see areas of tiny lines and shadows, and you start to diligently place all of these in. And very soon, your baby is no longer six months or a year old. It's now an 80 year old, and it looks like an alien. This chap here, how old is he? Looks like a footballer, doesn't he? So perhaps he's in his 30s or 40s. He's got quite a lot of lines on his face and we are safe to place these in. If they start to look a little bit too strong, we can soften them. When it comes to babies and babies' eyes and the shaping on their faces, I wouldn't even go as far as that. I'm using a pencil here just because it's pretty difficult to show you in pen. So we've got a nice wide open baby eye here. Now, if there's a little bit of shadow below that eye, I'm not going to draw a strong line in. I'm probably going to get my pencil on a scrap of paper, pick up some graphite and just smudge this in. I can't tell you how careful you need to be when drawing children and babies not to put strong lines in. 
Just this week on a Facebook group, I saw somebody asking why their drawing of a child looked so old, and this is the reason. Always softness and blending with children's faces. Don't forget to let me know in the comments what you found helpful about this video. Of course, if you have any questions or any suggestions for other similar videos that you might like to see me make here on YouTube. And before you leave the video, don't forget to have a look in the video description. You'll find details of my full drawing course down there. You can also grab some free stuff. I've got some free downloadable PDFs. I've even got a free painting course that you can take for no money whatsoever. Lots of other good free stuff down there too. And if you enjoyed this video, I think you're going to enjoy one of my most popular drawing videos. You can watch that one right now.